for anybody who doesn't know, Dan is the editor of Cycling UK's Cycle magazine. So if you're a member of Cycling UK, you will receive the magazine, I think it's once, once a, is it once every two months? Every two months, yeah. Every two months, yeah. Um, and am I, am I right in thinking that Cycle magazine is Britain's largest circulation cycling magazine? It is, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, we overtook um, cycling plus some years ago. We kind of passed each other, going in opposite directions. <laughs> okay, well, another good reason to join um, Cycling UK because you get it for free if you're a member. Uh, right, I'm going to switch my microphone and my video off uh, and hand you over to Dan, and I shall see everybody on the side. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, first of all, apologies to anyone who attended my talk a couple of years ago in Clitheroe when I spoke about um, similar kind of uh, similar kind of themes to the ones I'll be addressing in this talk, which is essentially that you can tour on whatever you want and whatever you've got. Um, although there are of course, ways to improve the bike that you've got, make it a bit more suitable for touring. But essentially, if you've got a bike, you can go and tour on it. Um, the picture you can see on the opening slide is of Joff Summerfield. He rode 10,500 miles around the world on his penny farthing, which he built himself. Now, a uh, penny farthing is not the... Um, first bike that most people would choose to go on a tour with. It's obviously a fixed wheel bike, one gear, um, no freewheel, um, doesn't ordinarily carry luggage, although Joff has managed to put plenty on his. Um, but of course the first round the world tour was done on a penny farthing by Thomas Stevens back in, Oh, 1880, around about then anyway. I can't remember exact, the exact date off the top of my head, but by the time Thomas Stevens returned from his world tour, um, the safety bicycle was already starting to take off. So he, was, um, he finished his tour on a bike that was already becoming obsolete. But as Joff proved more than a century later, um, if you still want to go touring on a penny farthing, you can do exactly that. Why would you tour on that or any other kind of bike um, rather than a two or three thousand pound bespoke touring bike that's been designed um, precisely to go touring on? Um, at the moment, one of the reasons is that the bikes could be unavailable. Um, the surge in bike sales because of COVID is welcome for the uh, bike industry. And it's great to see more and more people on bikes, um, but there is a shortage of bikes right now. So if you're going to go touring after lockdown um, in times of social distancing, which I think Andrew um, talked about um, over the weekend, then the bike that you want to have might be completely sold out until next year, or it could be stuck in a shipping container outside Felixstowe because there are big problems with international shipping at the moment. The containers are all in the wrong places. So the one reason that you might not tour on a proper touring bike is that you just can't get hold of one. Another reason, of course, is that the bike you've got is your only bike. If you don't tour on this, you don't go on tour. Um, or you might be choosing to go on this bike because it's different from a touring bike and better for what you have in mind. That might be because you, want, you might want to do more miles faster on an Audax style bike with doing credit card touring. Uh, you might be riding off road. Uh, on a mountain bike or gravel bike and although a touring bike will do that you might have a different kind of off-road tour in mind um, and another reason is that it's easier tr to transport um, particularly if you're not going to fly um, traveling with a full-size bike can be quite awkward you can get them on most ferries 
uh, and you can get them on trains. Um, you can get a, a number of them on trains, but not always um, conveniently and particularly not always in this country or when you're leaving the UK by train to go to Europe because um, you can only get two fully built bikes on Eurostar, which is awkward. The final reason, of course, that you might go touring on um, a bike that isn't a touring bike is that, you know, it's a free country. If you want to ride the end to end on a rally chopper, go for it. Um, and that's really the too long didn't read or too long didn't listen version of this webinar. Um, adaptations to any bike are optional. If you've got a bike and it's got wheels, then you can pretty much go touring on it. Um, the picture is of um, George Mahood, who rode this 24 inch wheel Falcon kids road bike most of the way from Land's End to John O'Groats. Um, it's one of the least suitable uh, bikes for doing the end to end um, that I can think of really. It didn't fit him. Um, it did get there. He got there. He didn't ride it all the way because um, as he describes in his book, Free Country, which is worth reading, um, he set off with a friend of his um, from Land's End, um, dressed at the time only in a pair of Union Jack boxer shorts. And their intention was to get from Land's End to John Groats in less than three weeks um, without spending any money. So they were entirely dependent on the kindness of strangers. Uh, and someone gave him this bike en route. Um, in I think Devon or Cornwall. So he rode it all the way from there to, um, uh, to John O'Groats. Before we look at how you might adapt a bike to make it more suitable for touring, I think it's worth looking at what makes a tourer good for touring in the first place. Um, and if you do own um, a touring bike that is worth quite a bit of money, then hopefully this will make you feel a bit better about owning it because um, whilst it is true um, that all bikes are capable of touring, some are, are better at touring than others. And if you want to go, if you want to do a traditional um, two or four panniers tour long distance, on road or, or good quality dirt roads, a, a, a proper touring bike is hard to beat. Um, the reasons for that are it's designed to carry a large load, not just a person. Um, it'll have one or more pannier racks. It's got a long wheelbase. Uh, the long wheelbase means you won't um, kick your rear panniers with each pedal revolution. It's got a stiff and sturdy frame so that if you stand up on the pedals, um, or even if you're just riding hard, the, um, the frame won't flex under the weight of the luggage that you've attached to it. And it'll have low gears, um, which is a theme we'll come back to, excuse me, for getting you and your luggage up any hills that you encounter. Now, the geometry of a touring bike is different. Um, it's more upright. Um, the handlebar is higher and generally a bit closer to you. Um, which is better for your back and neck and long rides. Um, the seat angle is shallower. Um, and increasingly, lots of bikes have quite a steep seat, seat angle, both road bikes and mountain bikes, and quite often gravel bikes as well. Um, and whilst that makes for an efficient riding position to get power down onto the pedals, um, it also puts a lot of weight on your hands. Um, a shallower seat angle lets you sit further back on the bike uh, and it transfers weight from your hands to your backside. Um, and a longer wheelbase that I mentioned in conjunction with the fact that it has more steering trail gives the bike a nice, a nice stable handling. So you can relax and look around as you're riding along rather than um, worrying about um, uh, keeping the bike pointed in a straight line. Uh, the tires are usually mid-width, sort of 32 millimeters, 35 mil, 38 mil. 
Um, and they're better at carrying loads than skinny tires. They, they insulate not just you, but also the load from vibrations. Uh, and it's just, it just feels much better carrying an equivalent load on slightly larger tires than it does on um, skinny tires pumped up hard. And the fact that a traditional Tora has a drop handlebar means you've got um, multiple positions to put your hands in. Um, because you can move your hands around onto the drops, if you going, want to go fast or there's a headwind or on the hoods or on the tops, you've got several different positions to put your hands and it just stops them aching. And also your shoulders aching as well because you're changing your position on the bike. So those are all good things about um, uh, Taurus that are, are worth having in some respect in any other bike that you might use to tour on. Uh, now you, you would hope that Taurus were sort of out of the shop um, perfect for touring. And if you get a um, one made made for you, a bespoke tour, then it can be exactly that. If you're getting an off the peg tour, it might not be just right for the kind of riding that you want to do. Um, in particular, um, and uh, this is something I've seen recently on bikes that I've tested for Cycle Magazine, a lot of tours are over geared. Um, and that's because they're trying to marry um, uh, integrated road shifters like Shimano's STI um, with a mountain bike rear derailleur. Um, usually they go with a, a road front derailleur or sometimes they'll have a road rear derailleur as well. And that restricts the gears you can have, first of all, uh, road group sets and mountain bike group sets don't want to play with each other very well. Um, and if you stick only with road group sets, you're stuck with higher gears. So some of the fixes for that, uh, as I say, even on off the peg tourers, are one of the easy, easiest is to get a derailleur hanger, which I've uh, pictured on the right. Um, and that uh, fits onto the derailleur hanger you've got, the extender, and it makes the derailleur sit lower. So you can use a larger cassette without the derailleur that you've got fouling that cassette when you go onto the big sprockets. And it means you can, instead of having perhaps an 11 to 32 or an 11 to 34 um, cassette at the back, you can go to uh, 11 to 40 instead. And that gives you much lower gears for, uh, or significantly lower gears for climbing. Um, the other way you can sort the gears out is to give up on um, uh, integrated shifters and use bar and shifters instead. If you do that, um, you can within reason use pretty much any derailleur combination you want to use. So you can use mountain bike gears, which arguably for loaded touring, that's what you want, gears that go as low as a mountain bikes. Um, the other thing you can do is make sure if you've got a triple chain set, which a lot of touring bikes do, that the inner chain ring is small enough. Uh, a road triple tends to be um, something like 50, 39, 30 in number of teeth. Um, if that, if you go for a smaller triple than that, which, um, or smaller rings at least, something like um, 48, 36, 26, then that makes, you know, a, a 26 by 34 bottom gear is not bad. Um, and that's something some, you will find on some off the peg touring bikes, um, Surly in particular, take that route. Other things you might want to change in your touring bike, even if you've got one, you might not want the drop bars. Drop bars aren't the only way of getting multiple hand positions on a bike. Um, we live in a, a sort of golden age of um, unusual, um, in inverted commas, flat handlebars that have got different shapes from just a, a straight um, flat bar. 
There are Jeff Jones loop bars, Surly's Maloco bars, um, uh, Butterfly bars. They all work well and they give you multiple hand positions so you don't get aches and pains. And because they're basically flat bars, they solve um, gearing problems for you as well. Um, because you can use just mountain bike shifters and mountain bike derailleurs. So at, at a stroke, um, if you're build, particularly if you're building up a bike, um, uh, having some sort of flat bar means you can get gears as low as you want. Um, Tours often sometimes come with, as I said, sort of 32, 35, 38 mil tires. That's that's all right for for going along um, road and you know good quality dirt roads. But if you want to go somewhere where the dirt roads are worse than that, or it's um, on a bridle way that's a bit rough, you might want wider tires than that. Um, on some tours, again, certainly a, a good in this respect, there's clearance to run bigger tires um, up to sort of 50 millimeters. And being able to run a, run a wider tire a bit softer um, it will make a ride that includes a significant element of off-road riding a lot more comfortable. Um, and if your tour has got disc brakes, even if you can't fit wider tired 700C wheels in there, you might be able to fit wider tired 650B wheels in there because they're in, obviously they're a smaller diameter and uh, there might be more room uh, between the um, chain stays and seat stays um, at the edge of a 650B wheel, whereas a, a, a a, a 700c wheel with a similar size tire would be um, trying to squeeze into a point where the seat stays and chain stays narrow. Um, you probably, I guess, if you've bought a Tory, you're not going to get fit new wheels to it straight away. But if you're building a frame up, then and you're buying wheels anyway, I think it's worth the expense of having a dyno hub front wheel. Um, if you combine that with something like, not only does that give you lighting, but if you combine that with something like um, Bush and Muller's Lumatech IQ2 Luxos, um, that's a dynamo lamp that has a USB out on it. So you can use your dynamo to charge things like your phone as you're going along, uh, or to charge a, um, like a, a power pack, a, you know, a, a separate battery. Uh, that you can subsequently use to um, charge up a phone or other electronic devices. And on any kind of extended tour, that freedom from kind of battery anxiety you get with things like phones is, is well worth having. So that's tourers. Uh, mountain bikes can make excellent tourers anyway for... Um, To get a good a, a good cheap tourer, um, an old steel mountain bike from the early 90s or, or, or late 80s can be an excellent option. They're, they're, they're cheap, they're tough, they've got low gears. Um, most of them have things like rack mounts as well. So certain kinds of mountain bikes are almost touring ready as it is. Um, more modern ones, perhaps less so because um, you're more likely to find suspension on it on them, which is good for both comfort and, and bike control on really technical terrain. But suspension also limits the luggage options as well. It, it, you can't put, well, you can put racks on um, suspension forks uh, and it, it is possible to fit racks to the rear triangle of a, a um, uh, a bike with rear suspension as well. Um, but it's a bad idea, even when it is possible, because you want um, any luggage um, to have the benefits of the suspension. Otherwise, your bike will sort of wallow and, and feel absolutely terrible. Um, so a hardtail bike with just front suspension or even a fully rigid mounted bike um, with bigger tires 
is arguably a better option for bike packing. Uh, and you can see on the picture on the right, that's um, uh, fellow speaker Marcus Stitz and his mountain bike. He's in Australia at that point on his round the world tour. Uh, and I haven't asked Marcus what bike that is. I'm, I'm guessing it's, I think it's a surly, possibly a surly karate monkey. Um, and that is a rigid steel uh, mountain bike, basically. Um, he did it on a single speed, showing that, you know, you don't have to have uh, all the gears. Uh, you might want more, more gears than that. In terms of luggage that you put on your bike, um, it's a question of what sort of terrain that you'll be riding. Um, if you're going to be touring mostly on roads or, or good quality dirt roads and your mountain bike will take a rear rack, then panniers and a rear rack work well. Um, bike packing bags like the ones Marcus has on his bike work better for actual off-road riding. Um, the load is kind of um, centered better on the bike and also it forces you to carry less if you've got um, bike packing bags compared to panniers. If you're gonna do um, proper mountain biking like at trail centers or in the Alps and you're moving on, then a, a small backpack can work uh, with just you know clothes and things like that in. Obviously you don't want too much weight on your back. So anything that's heavy like water, tools, if you can find some way to fix those to the bike, do that um, because the um, uh, you'll get a lot less shoulder ache and, and backside ache from doing that. And also having less weight on your in your backpack means it won't kind of try and overtake you on a really steep rocky descent. A problem that mountain bikes have is that normally you've got that um, flat handlebar which works good for control um, when you're mountain biking, but on a long ride, it's fatiguing. So as a bare minimum, I would say fit bar ends. Um, Cane Creek Ergo controls are particularly good. Um, flared Ergon grips, those aren't bar ends. They're just, um, the, um, the grips are sort of flare outwards towards, your, towards the end of the bar and they support the heel of your hand better so it doesn't ache as much or the alternative which it looks like marcus um, has on his bike are funky bars like jeff jones ones where you've got multiple hand positions if you're going to tour on your mountain bike you probably want to change the tires on it um, because it will have tires suitable for riding around trail centers and so forth um, you might not want to go the whole hog and fit um, big wide slicks on it unless you're going on road. And by big wide slicks, I'm talking about things like uh, Schwalbe Big Apples. But you might be able to find a compromise that works for you for the riding you're doing most of the time. And lightly treaded tyres like Surly's Nard or Schwalbe's G1 Bite, which is a, um, a gravel bike tyre really, but comes in mountain bike sizes. They also, they roll okay on the road and they'll give you more grip than a slick tire off-road. Gravel bikes have already mentioned. So the good news, the bike, industries, the bike industry has made a whole luggage range just for you. Um, one issue with um, uh, bike packing type bags, however, is that they are quite high up on the bike, a lot of them. The, there's, you know, you've got your bar roll and your seat pack um, and those are the, the sort of two, apart from a frame bag, a big frame bag, they're the two big volume uh, bits of luggage on the bike. Um, obviously, as with packing uh, any touring bike, put the heavier stuff lower down. So put um, things like clothing, uh, sleeping bags, sleeping rolls high up and anything heavy put that in the frame bags or in um, tool canisters underneath the down tube or, or, or whatever. Uh, if you can keep the weight low down, the bike will handle better uh, and it'll be easier to move when you're off the bike as well. Small panniers, and by small panniers, I mean um, uh, 
front panniers that are sometimes called universal panniers. They will work um, if your bike, uh, gravel bike, will take a rear rack. Um, but they're better the less bumpy the riding is. So uh, a bit like um, the kind of off-road touring that you might expect to do on a touring bike. Um, if it's that kind of terrain, the gravel bike with panniers will work okay. If it's more extreme um, or rougher, not even extreme really, um, bike packing bags will work better. One problem that gravel bikes have is that a lot of them have one bike gearing now, which is simple and intuitive, but the chain ring is probably too large for carrying much of a load. You'll, excuse me, you'll probably find something like a 40 tooth chain ring um, married to a large cassette, perhaps 11 to 42. That's quite an easy fix. I just, just fit a smaller chain ring on it. Uh, take a few links out the chain. Uh, and lastly, consider changing the tires. Um, because gravel bikes have a kind of uh, off-road uh, image, they often come with treaded cyclocross style tires, which depending on where you're riding may not be the best option. Um, relatively slick tires um, like uh, Schwalbe Marathon Supreme or anything from the Rennie Hurst range, like their Barlow Pass, um, their large chamber, you know, big volume tires um, that still roll okay on dirt roads, but they roll much, much better on tarmac for any bits that you're linking in between. And, and the picture shows the uh, different Rene Hurst tires, they're Snoqualmie Pass tires that I've got on my Genesis Vagabond. Um, and they roll really well um, on tarmac. And they're, they're fine for any kind of off-road riding I would do on that bike, uh, even though it would take 29 mountain bike tires. Um, by the time you need 29 mountain bike tires or you know proper mountain, proper off-road tires, you've probably exceeded the kind of um, the point at which um, you're comfortable riding it on that bike anyway. Road bikes. Uh, picture first this time. The bike pictured is the bike that Iger Kofse, I think he pronounced his name, he rode 4,000 kilometres on that through France. Um, his luggage, including all the clothes he stuck up, uh, stood up in, weighed three kilograms. Um, it's just a normal road bike. Um, he just packed very, very light. It's really, really minimalist. Um, almost all of his luggage is in a uh, small stuff sack, which is um, uh, fitted under the saddle. And he's got a camera bag on his handlebar. Uh, and that's it. Um, have a look at his website, see how he did it. There's a link, uh, the address is there. Um, but that kind of approach is probably, even if you don't go as extreme as Igor Kov say, the best approach to take with a road bike, travel as light as possible. They've got lightweight wheels with not very many spokes in, they've got lightweight frames, and they not only will they survive better um, with a lighter load on them, they'll also ride much better. So even if you can fit a rear rack to a, a road bike that you're planning to go touring with, um, think twice. Um, it might be better to just pack lighter in the first place. Uh, obviously, road bikes come with narrow, high pressure tyres. Um, fit the widest ones you can, really, for comfort. Then you can drop the pressure a little bit without worrying that you'll bottom out on the rims and it'll be more comfortable. The good news is that road bikes, um, particularly disc road bikes, we're starting to see more clearance for bigger tires on these bikes. And the tires themselves are becoming available in larger sizes. So a fast uh, but durable road tire like Continental Grand Prix Four Season is now available in a 32 millimeter width. You know, you don't have to ride around on 25 mil or 23 mil tires just because you've got a road bike. And I mentioned Rene Hurst again, they also do tires in the sort of 28 to 
32 mil range as well, which a lot of road bikes will take, certainly 28s, depending on whether or not you've got um, disc brakes or uh, side pull brakes. The riding position on road bikes is designed for efficiency. So it's very good for going fast on, that's, that's the in, whole intention of the bike, the racing bikes, but it's not always the most comfortable. It's a cheap fix to put right or, or more right anyway, um, just fit a, a short stem with plenty of rise on it. Um, it look a bit odd. Um, uh, roadies who have um, read uh, the Velomenati's The Rules um, will rib you for it, but a, a shorter, more upright stem will make your bike better for touring on, unless you're already super comfortable on the setup you've got. Uh, and the, arguably the biggest problem for road bikes is that um, the gears are too high. They're, they're gears for racing on. So you've got lots of high gears, you've got some middle gears, and you've got very few low gears. And that's less of a problem the less you're carrying, um, but it's still a problem. The, there's a couple of ways to fix that. The easy one, I guess, is to fit a derailleur hanger extender and a bigger cassette. That's relatively inexpensive. You can do that for, um, what would that cost? Probably about 75 pounds, I guess, for both. Uh, and you can, can continue using the same shifters, um, but you'll have low gears. Um, the other option, which you can do as well, it's not an either or, is to fit a more compact double chain set. Most road bikes will have a 50, 34 double. Um, you can fit something much smaller um, and it'll make the gears much more suitable. The, at the expensive end, you've got something like the White Industries R30, but at the cheaper end, Spa Cycles do um, a super compact TD2 um, chain set. And with that, you can have something, instead of a, a double like a 5034, you can have something like a 4226. And a 26 tooth in a ring is much better than a 34 if you're grinding up a long hill with a bit of luggage. Um, and that um, 4226 should still work with a... Um, a road front derailleur, although you may need to, you will need to move it a little bit on the um, uh, seat tube. Uh, folding bikes. Um, some folding bikes come almost touring ready, um, as it is. The Birdie in particular from Reza and Muller, um, various animals and some turns as well. Uh, they often have luggage options available like rear racks. Uh, and all you really need to do is put panniers on. These bikes tend to ride, well, not necessarily animals because they kind of cover different types of folding bikes from road bikes through to sort of off-road bikes through to hybrids. But most folding bikes are kind of, in kind of cycling terms, are, are, are more like hybrids. Um, and yeah, those bikes can be toured on pretty much as is. If you've got a smaller wheel bike like a Brompton, and I'm gonna focus more on the Brompton now because it's such a popular folder, um, there are, it's, it's more compromised for, for touring. So there are more things that you need to think about. But um, given that it is difficult to transport um, bikes and difficult to transport sometimes even larger folding bikes uh, on trains and on buses there is a good argument for certain kinds of tours on a Brompton so things you can do with an off the peg Brompton if you're buying it new or if you want to change one that you've already got reduce the gearing again um, Bromptons do come with reduced gearing options with um, smaller chain rings and bigger sprockets uh, and either go for the three speed with re reduced gearing or the six speed with reduced gearing. Uh, Brompton's front bag works fine for touring um, and actually having some weight there 
makes the steering a bit more stable. So it's it, it's worth having. Um, get a bike cover for it as well. Then you can just walk onto trains, uh, into hotels and not be questioned. It's just less hassle. You don't always need a cover, but it's worth having. Um, there are Bromptons with different kinds of handlebars. There's the MM type handlebar, possibly. I can't remember. The, the one that kind of comes up high, it's a bit like, I suppose, most like a, a butterfly handlebar. Um, but broadly speaking, Bromptons come with a, a sort of flat or riser handlebar with only one hand position. You can improve that by fitting grips like Ergon GP2s there. I mentioned Ergon grips before, they're the ones with a sort of flare on it to support the heel of your hand better. And the, um, some of them like the GP2 have integral bar ends. So you, it gives you another hand position, which is especially useful for um, riding up hills or just for easing your hands. Um, faster tires make a big difference on a small wheel bike. Um, you can get Schwalbe ones or Schwalbe Kojaks uh, and they ride a lot better than the stock tires that you get in a Brompton. Um, but if you're gonna use those tires, uh, you need to be confident that you can take the rear wheel off your Brompton and put it back on again, because they will puncture more often than the more heavy duty tires that come on a standard Brompton. If money is no object and you're buying, oh, I bespoke Brompton Brompton, I've got it twice there. So good, I named it twice, I'll delete that. Um, if you're buying a new Brompton specifically to go touring on, like specifically to do um, multimodal touring on trains, wherever, buses, and you don't mind spending money on it, get in touch with Ben Cooper at Kinetics because he'll turn what is an excellent city bike into a capable touring bike. He can put things like disc brakes on it. He can fit it with a roll-off hub or an Alphine hub. He can put Schwalbe Big Apple tires on it, which uh, will make it more comfortable uh, and make um, any potholes or rough roads um, be much more easily navigable on a Brompton. And the one that's pictured on the right is, is one of Ben's. And that's, you know, 14 speed disc brakes, um, Son Dino Hub, two inch tires. It's, you know, that is, I know it looks like a Brompton. It is a Brompton, but that is a capable touring bike right there. It isn't cheap though. If you've got a town bike, um, you can tour on that pretty much as it is. Most town bikes will carry luggage. Uh, and they're pretty comfortable for kind of riding around on. The riding position is more set up, a bit more upright. Um, the, the main downside with town bikes, and I'm particularly thinking about roadsters here, not so much um, hybrids, are that roadsters are heavy and they tend to come with hub gears like um, Sturmey three speeds. Um, and that's not a lot of range. Um, the easiest solution is to choose where you tour with a bike like that. Obviously some places are plenty flat, like Norfolk, the Netherlands, um, but also um, following uh, a river down towards the sea on continental cycle paths, such as in Germany, where they're really well surfaced cycle paths. And because you're mostly going downhill, um, the fact that you've got heavy bike with few gears doesn't matter that much. The second solution um, is to fit a bigger sprocket to the hub. If you've got a three speed hub, it may have something like a, I don't know, a 16 or an 18 tooth sprocket on at the moment. Sturmey Archer go up to 25 teeth for those sprockets. I don't know what Sturmey Archer sprocket costs. Um, I can't imagine it's more than about 15, 20 pounds. And you can change the, the way that your gears are set up, even with just a three speed set up then. You can have your third gear as your normal riding along gear. Um, and then you've got two easier gears for riding up hills below that, rather than the kind of, you know, as stock three speeds come with second gear as your riding along gear with one higher gear that you don't really need because you can always free wheel and one easier gear that's not really easy enough. 
Um, the other solution is um, more expensive. Um, it need not be ridiculously expensive. It's just to fit a whole new rear wheel and shifter. Um, you know, a rear wheel built around a wider range hub like Shimano's Alfine. I wouldn't suggest necessarily getting a um, hub built around um, something like a roll-off hub unless uh, you've got the money to spend because that's really expensive. But Shimano Alfine 8s and Nexus Inter 8s are, are relatively affordable. So you could have, you could turn your three-speed roadster into an eight-speed roadster with a good range for, um, I don't know, a couple of hundred quid or so, I guess. Um, and then you can enjoy touring on it rather than endure touring on it. Having said that, the picture shows Horace Dahl, who crossed Iceland in 1933 on a roadster. Um, his was the first crossing over the, I can't remember how it's pronounced, the, um, the big sort of uh, rocky desert in the middle of Iceland, the Spreggy Sander or something like that. Uh, he did it on a roadster. And of course, he was wearing a suit and tie because it was 1933. Um, I think he even took some shoe polish with him so he could... Um, polish his shoes before he returned to civilization when he completed his trip. So those we've looked at different bike types. Um, these low gear solutions might be applied to almost any bike type. I mentioned um, uh, gear hanger extenders before. Um, the first one I was aware of was Wolf Tooth's Road Link, but you can get other very similar ones to this that are cheaper. Um, and this, this one component that costs maybe, I don't know, 15 pounds or something, means you can then fit, you can swap out the cassette that you've got on your bike um, and fit a much bigger cassette, such as uh, one of Sun Racer's 11 to 40 tooth cassettes and still use the same derailleur that you've got already in the same shifter. So it's, it's an inexpensive way of um, getting lower gears that's, that's relatively easy for any kind of home mechanic to do as well. The only complication will be chain length. Um, if you can have a bigger cassette and not change your chain rings, you're gonna need more chain. Uh, and you might get to the point where you've got so much chain that the derailleur doesn't have the capacity um, to um, keep it um, taut in the when you're in the smallest um, smallest front chain ring. Um, that's not a disaster. Um, there were French cyclotourists in the uh, early twentieth century who um, often rode around with kind of saggy chains and they got on fine. Uh, saggy chains aren't the end of the world, whereas a chain that's too short could um, make you lose teeth. When Because if you try and shift into um, a gear that the chain won't stretch to, it'll snap the derailleur uh, and you'll come to a sudden and unpleasant halt. As well as... Um, gear hanger extenders, there are things like JTEC shift mate. Um, they change the um, uh, cable pull ratios of um, cables going in and coming out. It's like a little, um, uh, the wheel has two guides on it um, of uh, different sizes so that you can combine say a Shimano road shifter with a Shimano mountain bike derailleur, or you can mix and match Shimano and SRAM or SRAM and Campagnolo. They've got loads of different ones. Um, and there's a big chart showing what you need to, to convert one kind of um, cable input to the, to the output that you want. Um, bar and shifters. Um, Again, something we seem to be in a bit of a golden age of now, thanks to Microshift, who do bar and levers for both road and mountain bike derailleurs uh, in various speeds. So 
you can run you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 or 12 speed um, mountain bike derailleurs um, with levers that you fit, with shifters that you fit on the end of the drop bars that you've got on your touring or road bike. So if you're building a bike up, then it, it's a relatively inexpensive way to get really wide range gearing. Some luggage solutions. Um, there are racks available that fit to bikes that aren't that don't come with the um, frame fittings for racks to attach to. Um, tail fin uh, do a number of racks specifically designed to fit road bikes and gravel bikes. Um, it's not cheap and you've got to use their own custom bikes, but there are cheaper options available. Uh, Bond Trade you do one um, that fits to uh, like the um, tail fin fits to the, uh, the rear axle rather than to um, separate bolts that go into the frame. Um, Old Man Mountain do something similar uh, and Thule do a system called Pack and Pedal which attaches, uh, <coughs> excuse me, attaches to the seat stays. Um, but you can only really put lighter loads on, uh, something like the pack and pedal in particular. Um, and it's, it's not something I would put on a carbon uh, rear triangle. Then there's the traditional option, the Caradesis Camper Long Flap, um, a 24 litre saddlebag. You can fit to pretty much any upright bike as long as it's got enough space between the tire and the saddle. It's such a big bag that you might want to have some kind of support underneath it. Um, either uh, a rear rack that you're not using panniers with. Um, Caradise will also sell you the black man support, which attaches to the saddle rails and, and provides a, a, a kind of a rack that comes down sort of in an L shape and fits under the bag, or I think it'll work with their SQR system that fits to the seat post as well. But anyway, as long as you've not got something like a, a carbon seat post for the SQR attachment, um, that gives 24 liters of uh, luggage capacity to, to you know, virtually anything. Again, just it is quite high up. so. Um, whilst there's lots of volume, you don't necessarily want lots of weight um, in such a bag. And the other option is a trailer. Um, there are lots of bike trailers around, a lot of them are cargo trailers. Um, there are some designed or either designed specifically for carrying panniers um, or just particularly suitable for carrying a load that you might take touring. I, I, I've picked out the Follow Me cargo trailer because it's, it's not particularly expensive. Um, and that's designed for like a rack top bag and a couple of panniers to go on. And that's great for a bike that you can't or don't want to fit a rear rack to. It's particularly useful for um, the kind of bike where you're leaving your accommodation on your bike and you don't want to take your luggage with you. So if you're traveling around on a, um, a mountain bike or a road bike, you can take lots of luggage with you and then enjoy a ride up, I don't know, Alpe d'Huez or, or down um, some Alpine off-road descent on your mountain bike. And yet still the next day be able to travel off with luggage somewhere. Uh, finally, um, you can tour any pretty much any bike with wheels, but there are some it would be challenging to try touring on. Um, triathlon and time trial bikes, that's a struggle. Um, they're really out on the sort of outer peripheries of the cycling world. And they're so different from everything else that... Uh, I mean, I guess it's theoretically possible to tour on a time trial bike or a BMX or the other bike there is a Sinclair A bike. And if you do manage to do it, I salute you. Uh, please write to me. I'm sure it would make a great um, article for Cycle. Um, but yeah, there are better options than this that you could pick up for £50 second hand. Um, and that's it. That's the end of the talk. I'll, I'll try and turn off screen sharing. Um, and we'll happily take questions. Okay, thanks for that, Dan. 
Um, that, that, yeah, it is fascinating knowing what all the options are. Um, even, I mean, I personally, I'm not very technically minded, um, but uh, yeah, some really interesting stuff there. Um, I'm actually going to start by somebody had asked the question, who was it? Alistair, Alistair Burns asked about uh, cooking and mm -hmm. <laughs> which has nothing to do with um, bikes, but uh, it's a good question regarding heating water. And yeah. I just said that I bought this, which cost me about £100 a few years ago, and I wouldn't recommend these kind of things at all because they have one setting, <laughs> which is fighter jet. Or, or, um, and they're, no, they're, they're brilliant at heating water, but they're not great when it comes to actually cooking anything. But what I would recommend is far cheaper, and it's this thing, which is just a, a screw-on um, valve for the top of a, a, a bottle. It does exactly the same job, but the beauty is that you can obviously regulate the gas and um, it's far, far easier to use that. And in terms of space and uh, weight, actually less than that contraption, highly designed by MSR, um, which does, does the same thing. I suppose the only advantage of that is the fact that um, it's protected against the wind, but uh, hey, just find a find a dry stone wall to, to sit next to. Also, if you're traveling abroad, abroad, particularly if you're flying, it means you don't necessarily have to take the gas canister with you. You can just take the um, yeah the, the top bit, and that's um, that'll probably go in the hold where a, a gas canister would be forbidden. Yeah, yeah, it's just a little screw-on thing, but very it's only about a tenner and uh, mm. excellent. Right, uh, back to the bikes um, now. Uh, some people have asked about changing handlebars from drop handlebars to flat handlebars yeah. and the, the factors that you've got to bear in mind. And I, I have experience of this because when I bought my Ridgeback Panorama about 10 years ago, um, the first thing I did when I realized that my back couldn't cope with drop handlebars was ask the bike shop to change it and they refused. Mm. Um, I, I then bought all the equipment and took it to another bike shop and actually just told them to change it, and uh, and they did it, and it worked fine, but it wasn't as easy as I thought. It's um, a big can job. Explain, can you explain the, the thoughts, that thought processes that you've got to go through when you change your handlebars? The problem is that you're going to have to, it's not just changing your handlebars, you're almost certainly going to have to change the shifters and the brake levers, which may or may not be integral, which, whichever way you're going. And that's, that's quite expensive. And you might also find that because you're changing the shifters, you want to change the derailleurs while you're at it. Because if you're going from, um, there's, no, there's no particular reason to stay with um, road bike derailleurs if you've now got mountain bike shifters. And also the mountain bike shifters won't work, probably won't work the road derailleurs, unless you've got something like um, one of those um, uh, JTEC shift mates to sort of change the cable ratio. So yeah, changing the handlebar and all the shifters and so forth is the right solution for a lot of people. But it's, if you're thinking about touring with a a flat bar or an unusually shaped flat bar, you're better off starting with a bike that has that sort of handlebar to begin with. Or even if it's just a normal flat bar, it's easy to track to change from a normal flat bar to something like a Jones loop bar. You'll just need longer cables. It's difficult to change from a drop bar to, well, not difficult, it's time consuming and expensive to travel to change from a drop bar to a flat bar. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, right, Ted asks, is it correct that top tube length, I think that's TT, top yeah. tube length for straight bars is different for one with drop bars? Yes. Um, and the reason is where you hold your hands. Um, on a drop bar bike, you, the default position for your hands is on the brake hoods. And the brake hoods, if you think about where the end of the stem is, um, are several centimetres in front of the end of the stem. On a flat bar, your, 
your hands are the same distance forward as the end of the stem. So, so say it's something like four centimeters. If you just swapped, if you just put um, drop bars on a bike designed for flat bars, you're suddenly having to reach, say, four or four, five centimeters further for the default hand position. Does that make sense? Okay, well, hopefully. I, uh, <laughs> I was reading the other questions. I wasn't. Uh, right. Um, Jeff asks, um, he's, he wants to know your advice about changing the sizes of supplied cassettes and yeah. chain rings to achieve a better, in inverted commas, range of gears. What would you advise as a low gear to cover any eventuality? He says he currently has the supplied 22 front chain ring with 32 on the cassette, which make, which gives a decent 18 inch bottom gear. Is it worth going any lower? Um, I wouldn't, but if he wants to, um, go for it, yeah. Um, 18 inches is, I mean, a, a gear of less than 20 inches is good for a touring bike. A, a lot of touring bikes come with it higher than that. I think a sort of a rule of thumb for, for touring with luggage, or, or certainly a rule of thumb for me, is that the, um, uh, the chain ring should be about two thirds the size of the biggest um, sprocket on the cassette, which 22, 32 more or less is. Okay, uh, Jude asks, um, can he use a very lightweight carbon fiber mountain bike uh, for backpack for bike packing? He's worried about strapping bags to the bike um, and damaging it. Uh, would helicopter tape be enough to prevent the damage? He says he wouldn't go over the weight limit for the bike. Um, helicopter tape probably would do it. Yeah, I think if it were me with a carbon fiber bike and knowing how expensive carbon fiber is, I'd be tempted to um, use old inner tube and wrap that around any um, points on the frame that the bags might touch, because um, uh, you can just wrap it round like you wrap handlebar tape really, and then secure it with a, a cable tie or something at, at the other end. And then you've got something which isn't, isn't just thicker than helicopter tape, but it's also um, more shock absorbing. And um, it's a little bit sort of tackier as well. So the bag should move around less on it. Okay. Um, Stuart asks about, um, or your thoughts on hub gears and belt drives. Now you mentioned hub gears in the, in the talk. Um, yeah. I actually, I, I have a hub gear and a belt drive, a carbon belt drive on my Koga World Traveler. And I think they're fabulous. The only problem I do have, and I've had it recently because I've just changed the, the inner tube on the back tire, is retensioning the carbon belt. Um, mm. You can buy a little app from, or you can download an app for your phone, a bit like a guitar tuning uh, app that, that measures the frequency, but it seems so erratic in terms of measurements. Um, but I would certainly recommend that combination. It's clearly not cheap, mm. um, but, but he wants to know your thoughts. What do you think about them? Um, it depends what your priorities are, really. Um, I've used um, uh, and tested belt drive uh, bikes with uh, roll-off hubs, because you, if you're going to use a belt drive, it has to be either a single speed or hub gear. You can't use belt drive with derailleurs. They won't work. Um, now, the advantages are, are it's cleaner. The belt should last longer than a chain. Um, it's quieter. Um, obviously, the, the gears are internal, so they should um, suffer less weathering and less wear. Um, the disadvantages are um, belt drives aren't as efficient as a chain, um, or let me qualify that, belt drives aren't efficient as a well looked after chain, um, because they're not, as not quite as flexible as chains. Um, so there's kind of resistance where it goes round the um, 
rear sprocket, uh, and they have to be uh, almost kind of drum tight um, so that they don't slip. So it's being held under tension. And if you've ever tensioned a, a chain too tightly on like a single speed road bike or a fixed wheel road bike, you can feel the difference when you kind of, when you pedal it or particularly when you do it by hand. And, uh, and you're getting some of that resistance in a belt drive as well. So it, it's slightly less efficient. If, you know, a couple of percentage uh, points of efficiency don't bother you, then that's, you know, it's not a problem. And, and a similar thing for hub gears as well. Um, hub gears can be very efficient in certain gears, such as direct drive, but the gears that are further away from direct drive are less and less efficient. And this is on a roll-off, for instance, is most noticeable in the whole set of, the bottom set of seven gears. The top set's really efficient. The bottom set, there's an extra reduction set, a reduction gear to get those same seven gears again, lower down. Um, so a roll-off slow gears, you can, you can feel it kind of, you can feel your pedal strokes kind of stirring the, um, the gearing around. And you can sometimes hear it as well. Now, again, it's not a lot of efficiency loss, but it's a little bit. If it doesn't bother you, go for it, great. But if it does bother you, it'll bother you all the time. So it, it kind of, it absolutely depends on what your priorities are. The, the other thing to bear in mind with um, a carbon belt is of course, if it breaks, if it snaps, you can't, you can't mend it. That's uh, true. And if you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a replacement, then you are going to be stuck. So I, th I've, I, I don't have a replacement for mine, but I, if I suddenly decided to go off and cycle um, in a very remote part of the world, I would, you know, I would have to take a, a spare with me. And you, uh, you would have to take it because even if you were touring somewhere where you might be able to get a replacement belt, it would have to be exactly the right length. It's not something that can be shortened or lengthened like a chain. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a on the frame you've got to have a frame which actually allows you to get the belt on there as well there's yeah. a little section of the of the on the rear of the on the, the rear of the bike what you can actually remove in order to get the 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 cable on the um the carbon belt on there it's quite mm -hmm. an ingenious solution and i yeah. like it but uh you know there are there are factors that you've got to consider mm -hmm. um uh helen asks what tools would you recommend for taking along for touring maintenance? What tools would I recommend? Um, well, not strictly a tool, but definitely take at least one spare in a tube, even if you're running tubeless. Um, a good pump uh, that you can not, don't just take any pump, take a pump that using which you can get your tires up to the kind of pressure you want them to be. So that will be different for different people. If you're quite strong and prepared to um, spend five or 10 minutes pumping your tire up, you might be able to get by with a mini pump. Um, if you're not so strong or not so patient, then a pump that you can rest on the ground and just press down onto a bit like a mini track pump will work a lot better. And you can get those from Lizine and Topeak make pumps like that. Topeak do one, Topeak's morph range. Uh, I can't remember what Lizine's called, um, but they're like little mini track pumps. So take one of those um, and take a, a multi-tool with um, the, um, that unless you tour with a belt drive, doesn't just have the Allen keys you need, but also has at least a cross head and a chain breaker on there. Some even come with spoke keys as well. Um, which are useful to if you snap a spoke or need to tension a spoke on tour. Um, how far you go with the tools that you can, obviously you don't want to take um, a whole workshop full of tools, but just be careful about those that you do take. There's, um, there is a tool called, a, I think it's a hypercracker, something like that. Um, and it's for removing a, a cassette without a great big spanner and a chain rip. Basically, you just stamp down on your pedals um, and it'll use the bike's own chain drive to unscrew the, um, um, the, uh, the cassette. So you can take the cassette off. 
Um, the first time I tested one of these, I, I did it on an aluminium bike that had an aluminium gear hanger. And I stamped down as the instructions um, told me I should. And uh, it immediately just snapped off the um, gear hanger and the cassette stayed exactly where it was. So um, yeah, use tools that, um, the, the only tools you really need to take are the tools that you know how to use and are confident that you will be able to use properly. Yeah, and on, on that theme, I think a, a good piece of advice that I was given after, after it happened was to, if you, picking up on what you've just said regarding if you don't know how to use the tool, then don't take it. But make sure, for example, with spokes, you've got, you've got replacement parts because you can always or usually find somebody who does have the tools and who does have the knowledge but might not necessarily have the exact part that you're looking for. So mm -hmm. things that commonly break, like spokes, for example, carry some spare ones. And at least then you don't, I mean, I wouldn't know how to change a spoke, um, but you can take it to somebody who has a workshop and say, hey, can you do this for me? And look, I've got exactly the, the right um, size of spoke that uh, I need. Mm, yeah, good point. Um, right, back to the questions. Um, Somebody has asked, I'm not sure if this is even possible, uh, could you recommend any bike for less than 75 quid? Um, um, I can, yes, but only in the sense that it's a generic um, second-hand bike that you find somewhere. Um, I um, once got a bike for £11 from an auction. Uh, it was an old steel road bike um, that I... Uh, used as a single speed road bike and took with a couple of front panniers on it um, around America. Um, and part of the reason I, I took that was that um, I was flying there. I figured, well, you know, the baggage handlers can do their worst with this soft, soft shell bag that I've got. And they're unlikely to do much damage to a bike that's worth 11 pounds in the first place. But finding bikes like that is just a question of um, luck and persistence, really. Um, I would advise to get a, you can find bikes costing less than £75 at um, secondhand shops in town, but I would advise um, looking at specialist cycling websites like Cycling UK's own forum, the secondhand sales there, or um, Pink bike is another one where you can people sell secondhand bikes. Um, and if you're buying a secondhand bike from a, an inverted commas proper cyclist, it will probably be a lot better than an equivalent priced secondhand bike you stumble across in a secondhand shop. Um, there's a question from Mike and he asks about wheel size. Um, he says, what's the best wheel size for touring? I read 26 inches more readily available everywhere, but tire choice seems better for 700C. It seems, well, when I when I started cycle touring, it was kind of a fashionable thing to, to go for the smaller wheel size, but those, mm. they seem to have gone out of fashion now. And most bikes do just come with a standard size wheel. Yeah, the, the bike industry kind of stabbed this 26 inch wheel in the back, really. There's <laughs> nothing wrong with it. It's, an, it's a nice size wheel at a good range of tires. Um, smaller wheels are slightly stronger, which if you're going to be heavily loaded or heavily heavy yourself is, is, is worth having. But I think um, these days, really, 26-inch wheel, quality 26-inch wheel bikes and tyres are harder and harder to find, certainly in, in the West. Um, when you travel outside of um, Europe or the English-speaking countries, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the choice these days, really, if you're buying new, is more likely to be between 650B and 700C. Yeah, there are some people who've made some comments here. Uh, smaller wheel gives a lower gear ratio as well. True, Wait, yeah. ten, wait 10 years, 26 inch will become fashionable again. <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, Tristam says he loves his 26 uh, inch wheel tourer. Uh, right, back to the questions. Peter asks if 
um, is a 1990 steel hard tail mountain bike any good for touring for example a specialized rock hopper um, and is anyone making the modern equivalent um, the first part of the question yes um, it is a good bike for touring the only thing i think it really needs that's a 1990s specialized rock hopper is um if that particularly if that's one of the steel ones is a rear rack adding and, and something to make your hands a bit more comfortable such as bar ends is anyone making uh, a comparable bike now? Not, not directly comparable, but you can get um, uh, fully equipped, uh, sorry, um, you can get rigid steel mountain bikes with all the frame fittings that you might want. They are still available. Um, Genesis do one called the Longitude. Um, Surly do a number of steel mountain bikes ranging from ones that will take bigger tires like the Krampus through to the Karate Monkey that I think Marcus Stitz was touring on uh, and a few others as well. So yeah, they are still available. Um, they're just um, a bit rarer. Uh, somebody called Mr. Anonymous Attendee has asked, what's the shortest stem you can get? I had the opposite problem actually. When I, when I changed those handlebars on the Ridgeback, <laughs> from drops to um, butterfly, I found that the, the position of the bars in effect was moved, was shorted you. forward. Yeah. Uh, so, so I had to buy an extremely long stem yeah. just to push the whole thing back. Yeah. And that was another implication of, of changing the handlebars. But uh, perhaps somebody's doing the reverse, I'm, I'm not sure. But what's the shortest stem you can get? Um, an extension of zero millimeters. So it kind of, sits on top of your steerer tube kind of like i don't know a lollipop or something i suppose yeah sounds a bit uh, like, a, like a fixie bike almost it's so in, instead of this instead of the stem you know progressing forwards it just it just sits right on top and you can thank you can thank the um mountain bike industry for that it used to be quite hard to get a hold of um uh short reach stems now you can have them down to whatever uh length you want um, I've got about a 30 mil stem on my mountain bike, I think it is, maybe 40. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but those sorts of lengths are readily available. Uh, and if you are making a changing a flat bar bike and putting drop handlebars on it, going to a much shorter stem, the opposite problem that you had, Andrew, makes, makes a lot of sense. And I wouldn't worry about people saying, oh, will it handle really peculiarly? No, not really. It'll handle a bit differently, but you'll soon get used to it. Um, a question from Simon. How do you look after your chain and cogs stroke chain set on longer or muckier tours? And there's another question actually earlier. Um, what lubricant is best? Waxed chains um, seem to have better wear. Um, so lubrication of chains what will be a good solution especially on longer muckier tours um my, my default cleaning cleaning device for chains is um two nail brushes um you can uh, in one hand you can clamp the nail brushes around the chain both sideways and on top and and pedal backwards and they'll they'll cheat they'll clean the worst of the muck off the chain quite easily. And you can also use the nail brushes to um, clear clean things like jockey wheels and the chain rings and that kind of thing and the cassette itself. And they cost um, next to nothing, and you can buy them virtually anywhere. Um, so if you even if you didn't leave home with any, you could you could find some easily enough. Um, yeah, don't just keep dumping oil onto a dirty chain because you'll turn it into a sort of horrible sludgy paste that will grind away at the um, chain and the, and the cassette sprockets and the chain rings and the, and the, and the jockey wheels. Um, which should you go for, dry lube, like uh, wax or, or wet lube? Okay. Personal choice, again, I guess. Um, I quite like um, cheap, light, um, wet oils. You know, you can buy them from anywhere 
Um, you use a bit more of them probably, um, but um, because they're cheap, you can just put some more on. Um, and another, I suppose, another advantage of a carbon belt is the fact that you can just chuck a bucket of water over it. Um, Very true. It yeah. doesn't require any lubricant, although I do use, because um, I found mine squeaked and it was annoying me. So I just use some silicon, silicon lubricant, mm. spray that on occasionally, um, or even just chuck some water on and it, um, and it stops the squeaking. Um, yeah. Right, a question from... Uh, I know we're, Laura, do tell me to stop. I think if we if we continue till half past, perhaps. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Laura um, can kick us off. Uh, would you recommend, this is from Kevin, would you recommend a smaller wheel for smaller people on small frames where there can be toe overlap? Yeah, um, in short. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a smaller wheel to avoid toe overlap. Um, it is possible to avoid toe overlap by having um, a fork with more offset so that it, it's bent forwards more in combination with a, a shallower head angle, um, which will also make the um, uh, front wheel slightly further away. But yes, there will come a point when you're making frames smaller and smaller where it's no longer possible to fit in um, a given size of um, uh, wheel and it's particularly a problem with um, drop bar bikes for small people because as we discussed earlier a drop bar bike will have a shorter top tube so your feet are closer to the front wheel to begin with on a drop bar bike than they are on a flat bar bike um, so yeah if a smaller wheel is what's required to avoid toe overlap go for it absolutely because Whilst toe overlap is something you can learn to live with, particularly on a road bike, if you, which you're going to be riding fast in a straight line largely, and you're going to be doing much of your steering just by leaning, on a touring bike, you're more likely to find yourself weaving up a one in five pass quite slowly. And if you're weaving, your front wheel is going to be going from side to side and you might hit it with your feet and then you'll stall at best and at worst fall off. Um, a question that was asked in the chat earlier, what are you, what are your views on zip tires? Zip. I think these are, these are tires. I've seen an advert where you can, there's a zip on the oh, side. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. You can change the tread. Um, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now I know what you mean. I was thinking of zip who also make, um, high-end wheels I wasn't sure if they had now started making tires tires that zip on and off um, yeah. don't buy them ever <laughs> uh, I think th there must be something underneath presumably a kind of a base and then you put the put the zip the the tread on presumably the advantage is that you can change the the tread quite easily yeah but in both situations whichever tire you've got on the top you've got a heavy and inefficient tire just if you want to change the tires just change the tires yeah don't don't, um, don't buy zip on tires if they're still around in 10 years i'll be amazed yeah and if you change your tires then marathon plus depends what you want um marathon plus are bomb proof um i had them on my brompton for a while and um rode over a bent nail which stuck into the tire and i only realized i only knew it was there because i heard a tick tick ticking sound and at every revolution, the, the, the bent nail, which had come out sideways from the tyre, was hitting the dynamo as it went round, the sidewall dynamo. But the, it hadn't actually punctured. It had gone into the tyre and come out sideways. So, yeah, they are, they are bomb-proof, our um, Marathon Plus tyres. But they are harder to get on and off if, if you do get a puncture. And they're heavy and they, they're not the best rolling. So if puncture resistance is your top priority, get them and wear life as well, because they last for thousands and thousands of miles. They're great. If, um, if you're happy fixing punctures or perhaps you've got tubeless sealant in your tires because you're running tubeless, then a, a lighter tire gives a, a nicer, faster ride. So you'll do more miles in the same time as you would have done. 
I'm just about to change my tires from their marathon, their Schwalbe um, Marathon Almotion um, mm. tires, which are quite fat tires on yeah. the uh, the World Traveler, the Koga World Traveler. I'm about to change them to back to um, Marathon Plus, but the they make. I'm not, I'm not sure how long they've done this, but they make a Marathon Plus Tour tire, which mm. the only difference is that it's got a um, more of a grip. Um, yeah. And I've, I've, I'm going to try those. They also come in quite wide, um, quite a wide tire. It's a 47 mm. millimeter, um, which uh, you know you were talking about comfort of ride earlier. And yeah. those fat tires, especially when you're carrying luggage, are are very very comfortable. Mm. Um, there was there was a question from Martin earlier. It's quite technical, but I'll read it. I don't really understand much of this myself. Uh, this is him speaking. I've read recently that you can fit an 11 speed chain to a 10 speed derailleur because the chain link internal dimensions are the same. Benefit is supposed to be a lighter chain and newer, stronger materials. Also, hollow pin links like Dura Ace are lighter and apparently stronger. What do you think? Um, it's not something that I've tried, so I can't. Um comment definitively um but it, it's something that i would have to sort of offer up and see and see whether it worked if the if the chain rings sprockets and jockey wheels aren't too wide for the narrower chain then yes it will work but it's not something that i would do even if it would work because um the weight you're going to save in a chain is pretty small um 10 speed stuff is cheaper to replace. Um, and even if the materials are better in the more expensive chain, I would, other things being equal, prefer a chain with fewer speeds. I don't, I don't have more than 10 speed on any of my bikes. Okay. Um, somebody, Linda, has made the comment that to the questioner who asked about zip tyres, referencing yesterday's talk, I think it was zip ties rather than zip tires uh, that were mentioned yesterday. So that might uh, ah, okay. Zip, zip tires do actually exist. Um, yes, but uh, clearly uh, zip that, ties. Yeah, take them. They're great. Yeah, um, the, quite a lot of people were making comments earlier about folding bikes and you know how good they are simply because if you want to combine getting on a train um, yeah. with cycling, um, then they're they're a good solution for that. Any comments? Yeah, I agree. Um, it would be nice if we lived in a world where um, you could roll up to any train station and hop on a train with your non-folding bike, but sadly, that's not a world we live in. Um, and if your intent is to tour jumping on and off trains, then a folding bike is absolutely the way to go. Uh, and the next best thing, I guess, is probably some sort of separable bike like a Molten or one with s, &S couplings, where it's not as convenient as a folding bike to take apart and break down, but it's at least possible. Yeah, um, Graham Joyce um, made the comment that he took his folding bike on Eurostar and it was four millimetres too big. <laughs> so he, yeah. he, said he, he said he let the tyres down and then it, it uh, <laughs> managed Excellent. to Right. Um, I think that's about we've kind of exhausted all the questions that have been asked, I think. Um, are you a lot of people were asking, are you going to because there's a lot of detail on your slides. Are you going to make those available anywhere so that people can see them? I know this this is going to be um, this is on Facebook, so you can go back and listen to or watch this again on Facebook. But your presentation itself, can you make that available so people can read it? I'll, I'll speak to Laura um, and if it's as well as Facebook, if it's not, yeah, we'll sort something out. I don't know where it will end up. Um, I imagine I can relatively easily get it on the Cycling UK website if it's not possible for it to go on any other. Well, you, I mean, I'm more than happy for you to put it on my website. If you, oh, right, okay. Yeah. If you email me the document, All right. I'll, I'll create a movie and, um, and I'll stick it on cyclingeurope.org. Uh, for okay. people to see on there that's that's no problem um, thanks andrew right so um uh thank you for everybody for those questions that was 
God, I feel like I felt like Paxman there. <laughs> <laughs> or Fiona and Bruce trying to figure out what everybody's questions are. Uh, right, brilliant. Um, so thank you, Dan. Um, thanks, Andrew. And um, yeah, thanks for everybody for been, listening and taking part. No, it's been fascinating. Even for, for somebody who's a bit of a technophobe like me, it's um, you know it's really it's really interesting listening to the to somebody who actually does know what he's talking about when it comes to uh, the technical sides of, of of bikes. And obviously, if you do subscribe to cycling uk you get the magazine and there is a good technical section in there isn't there yeah yeah we have, we have technical questions asked by members and you know we review stuff um i i think it's fair to say we review stuff that's not always reviewed in other sort of mainstream news stand magazines because um uh we're more interested in what people are kind of you know doing with their bikes it's not the bike industry can often be fashion led. And I think um, with the greatest respect to all touring cyclists, tourers are not themselves fashion led. They're doing it because they want to do it. And the fact that whether it's fashionable or not is irrelevant. Yeah. And for the, for the sake of four quid every month, which is what I pay to be a member of Cycling UK, uh, you get the magazine six times a year. So, um, you know, that on it in its own is, is worth the membership. Um, okay, so brilliant. I think uh, we'll finish it there. So thank you, Dan. And thank thanks, you Andrew. Thanks, for, everybody. Thanks for watching. And uh, see you later in the week, no doubt. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Do I hang up now? Uh, I think Laura just cuts us off.